Hi, yeah, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, welcome. Thank you, uh, thank you for coming back after lunch. Hope everybody's uh, not too kind of exhausted and full. So, um, this is going to be quite a, a hands-on active workshop, so hopefully uh, you're not going to be sitting kind of falling asleep listening to me too much. Um, so, I work for Tech Systems. Actually, who, who, just hands up, who came to my session yesterday? Okay, most of you, not everybody. So, I'll do a kind of a quick, quick introduction to myself. Um, I work for Tech Systems Global Services, um, and I lead our Agile Transformation Services practice based in the UK. Um, so, I live down in Brighton, which is uh, south of London. Once you've kind of come out of London, head south till you hit the sea, and that's kind of roughly where Brighton is. Um, although, um, I think comparing the size of the UK to the size of India, exactly where we are within the UK really doesn't make much difference. Um, when, when Naresh was doing his opening exercise yesterday, um, about how far people had traveled, I was desperate on Google trying to figure out how many kilometers it was, and it came out about just under 8,000 kilometers. Um, so yeah, I, I, we have a team in the UK. Uh, we kind of work with organizations um, on modernizing businesses, providing services to modernize businesses. And a lot of that is modernizing their ways of working. Hence, uh, we kind of go in and coach and train and consult on agile practices, lean and agile. Um, we're a US-based organization. Um, so I get to work with uh, my coaches, team of coaches in the US. And we also have an um, office in India. So one of my colleagues is, is around here somewhere. I don't think he's made it into the room yet. Um, so, yeah, I should start with just kind of explaining the title. There's a, there's a kind of a, a cultural reference here that um, probably isn't that obvious to most people. Does anybody recognize who this is or this picture? Sorry? Sorry, I can't hear. No. So, this is uh, Phil Collins. Anybody? So, does anybody know who Phil Collins is? Okay, a couple of people. So, Phil Collins was the singer of uh, the kind of prog rock band Genesis. Um, and in the late 80s, he, came, he had produced a solo album. Um, that solo album was called No Jacket Required. Um, and this is the album cover. So, what we've done here is we've just kind of put No Lab Jacket Required. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the kind of the explanation as like what the title is. What we're going to talk about is experiments and learning. Um, before we do that, um, kind of another people familiar with this Wordle thing over here? So you five had to guess the five letter word. Um, so kind of Wordle is a nice, simple kind of example of the sort of things we're doing. Because basically what you're trying to do here is learn what the word is. And each attempt is a bit like an experiment. So um, in this example, I always start with the word I do because it's got um, four of the five vowels in. So I kind of like to get the vowels early. Um, so in this example, I had the I. Then I went with groin. And now I knew the O was in the middle. I didn't know where the I was. Um, and then ivory. So I now kind of know the I isn't in those three. There's two other possibilities where the I is. Uh, the O, but I haven't got any letters. So each guess is, a, is an experiment. And you're learning from that experiment. And using that information, to hopefully get the word. Um, I'll come back to the end of it. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is now. I'll kind of come back and I'll show you kind of the final solution at the end of the uh, end of the workshop. So experiments. Um, who's talking about experiments? Well, actually, um, two of the keynotes this morning explicitly talked about experiments. Um, Dave Farley and Fred George both talked about it. Um, Kanban method. One of the Kanban method practices. Improve collaboratory and evolve experimentally. So Kanban talks about running experiments. Modern Agile, jo Joshua Karievsky's um, approach talks about experiment and learn rapidly. Lean Startup, um, maybe not experiments, but certainly talks about um, having hypotheses, testing in, in your hypothesis to, to learn and pivoting based on what you learn. Um, scaled Agile framework, uh, each feature should include a benefit hypothesis. So Hypothesis, if you've got a hypothesis, your experiment is, is there to test that hypothesis. Kinevin, we've heard about Kinevin in a few sessions. Um, so in complex environments, you can't follow recipes or conduct detailed analysis to understand the situation. Rather, you must experiment or probe. And I'll, I'll kind of, we'll maybe talk about the, the subtle difference between an experiment and a probe. Essentially, you know, we're trying things out um, to learn. DevOps. 
culture that fosters continual experimentation, taking risks and learning from failure. And then lastly, last example here, Deming and Schuert, who defined or designed the uh, kind of originally the Schuert cycle, Deming popularized it, so it's often known as the Deming cycle, PDSA, plan, do, study, act, or sometimes PDCA, plan, do, check, adjust. So you can kind of swap some of those words around. But so lots of talk about experiment going way back to, you know, the early days of lean through to, you know, modern agile, Kanban, uh, and everything in between. But I think sometimes we use the word experiment just, it's just another buzzword that we pick up and we talk about experiments, but are we really running experiments? Um, so this is a um, quote by Karl Popper talking about um, Albert Einstein. What impressed me most was Einstein's own clear statement that he would regard his theory as untenable if it should fail in certain tests. Here was an attitude utterly different from the dogmatism of Marx and Freud. Einstein was looking for crucial experiments whose agreement with his prediction would by no means establish his theory, while a disagreement, as he was first distressed, would show his theory to be untenable. This uh, is the true scientific method. But what this is saying, just kind of big long quote, Einstein wasn't just trying to prove his theories. He was trying to find ways to disprove his theories because he recognized that just proving his theories and just kind of getting successful experiments didn't really mean anything. What he, if you try and disprove your hypothesis the, and you can't disprove it, then that's just kind of giving you reinforcing that your hypothesis might be correct. But if all you try and do is prove your hypothesis, the risk is you, you, you fall into confirmation bias. So you're just doing things which, which look and help you feel confident, but you're not really getting anything. So what we're going to do is, is run through a couple of um, exercises, games, um, just to introduce this idea of what we really mean by experiments. Um, and we'll talk about how you might apply that um, in, your, in your own day-to-day -day and, and some of the things we can do. So two exercises. We're going to do this um, in, in table groups. And we probably want to have um, at least four or five people with table groups. So I'll kind of give you a bit of warning. Um, that you might want to kind of move tables so that you've got enough people on the table. I'll, I'll run through the instructions of the first exercise first, um, and then I'll give you a little bit of, bit of time to move around. So this first exercise, this first game, um, I came up with actually both of these. I, I came up with a, a friend called Matt Phillips, Matt Phillip, who's a, um, a US coach. Back um, probably four or five years ago, uh, I did a talk at Lean Agile Scotland up in Edinburgh, uh, entitled Failure is Not an Option, when I was talking about you know, the need for failure. And what, what I meant by failure is not an option was failure is not optional. So again, another bit of a play on words there. Actually, we have to fail if we're going to learn. Um, and Matt came and talked to me after that talk, and he was like, you know, have you got any, what, what games experiment, or sorry, what games or exercises you know, can we run, do you run with teams to kind of help them experience this? Um, and I didn't really have a good answer, so we, we brainstormed some ideas um, and, and came up with this as one of the exercises. Um, so, uh, kind of the background to it, there's actually an originally game called, by, by a guy called Robert Abbott, at, who created a game called Eleusis. Um, it's a card game, uh, and it, he designed it to try and teach scientific thinking to his students. Um, it's actually quite a complicated game. There's lots of really complicated rules to it. Um, somebody else had already kind of thought, this is cool, a bit complicated, and come up with a game called Eleusis Express. Um, and so this is the, the kind of URL where you can go and find about Eleusis Express. Um, I still, we kind of still thought, actually, that's still a little bit complicated. How can we make that even, even simpler? Um, and by simpler, you know, quicker to run. Um, so we call it Eleusis Expeditious. Okay, what's quicker than express? Well, you expedite something. So um, that's where it's come from. Just the, the, the name Eleusis, you know, I had to go and look this up. Uh, so I expect everybody's thinking the same thing. Where does that, what does that mean? Where does that come from? Um, it's named after a place in Greek uh, where there was something called the uh, Eleusis Mysteries. And there was a rite of passage to discover the Eleusis Mysteries. So there were these secrets. So I think, I think it's called that because what you're going to be doing is trying to discover a secret and you're going to be running some tests and coming up with some hypotheses to discover a secret rule um, that somebody, only one of you in your team will know. 
So the objective, and we'll do this over a number of rounds, so you're going to get a number of goes to do this, and experience it a number of times. Um, one of you in your team is going to be what's known as the oracle. The oracle is the all-seeing, all-knowing person that knows a rule. So the noble knows the secret rule, um, and they, they have a special role. So they're not going to be playing the cards. They're just going to be giving feedback and telling the rest of the team how they're doing in terms of, of discovering the rule. And we, we discover the rule by playing cards along a layout. So as the rogue, um, round progresses, you pick a card and you play it according to whether you think this new card conforms to a rule. So there's two types of two types of kind of layout. One is this is the main line. So this is the first card that gets played. And then all the cards along here conform to the rule. And then the sideline is where we discover a card that doesn't conform to the rule. So we play it below the card at which um, kind of the rule is, is broken. So um, I don't know. Looking at this, can anybody guess what the rule is? So the rule here is that um, every card must be odd and then even and then odd. So an odd card must be followed by an even number card, an even number card must be followed by an odd card. So what you can see here is we have got a two, that's even. The next card that gets played is a nine, that's odd. The next card that was played, or that was picked, was a jack. Now, jack is 11, counts as 11. So the, net, the rule says it should be even. So we play it down here, put it in the mind then, because it doesn't conform to the rule. So we're still looking for an even card. Next card is three, not even, so we play it down here. Next card is four, that does conform to the rule, so we, we put it back on the main line. After an even, it's be odd. And then we, we get another odd one, another odd one, another odd one, until we get another even one. Even, even, odd. Does that make sense? So, so the oracle is the person that knows that the rule is odd card, even card, odd card, even card. As a, the rest of the team, you're going to be taking it in turns to pick a card and have a look at the layout, have a guess, kind of think, what's my hypothesis? What do I think the rule is? And based on what I think the rule is, where do I think the card should go? Does this card conform to the rule, or does it break the rule? And you're going to put it where you think it's going to go, and the oracle who knows the rule will tell you whether you're right or wrong. And if you're right, you get to guess the rule. You kind of go, oh, if, if you're confident enough. Sometimes you have no idea, and it's just 50-50. It's a guess. But if you think you know what the rule is, you can say, oh, I think I know what the rule is. I think the rule is odd than even, and the oracle could go, well done, you've guessed the rule, um, you win. And that's the end of the round. If you get the rule wrong, guess the rule wrong, you know, you say, I think it's, um, let's say you think, I think it's, it's red card, so that, you know, it's not showing up red here because it's black and white, but red, then black, then red, then black, because you've only got here, the oracle will kind of go, no, that's not the rule, and you keep on going. So, um, probably just explained a whole lot of rules, uh, more than I should have explained there compared to the side. So you've got the horizontal timeline that do follow the rule, those sidelines that where you've kind of put the cards that don't follow the rule, and where in the sideline it is kind of tells you where it, it broke the rule. So the oracle knows the rule. So I'm going to tell you what the rule is, so you don't have to make up your own rule. Um, so I've got a stack of um, index cards with a number of rules on it. So first thing you'll do is decide who's going to be the oracle on your, in your table. That oracle will come to me. I'll tell you what the rule is. Um, handy if you bring a phone with you and take a picture of the rule, because some of them, they get a bit complicated and they're difficult to remember. So um, the, the easiest way usually is just come up, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put it on the floor somewhere. You can take a picture with it, and then you can just keep referring back to it. Um, in order to remember, so you don't have to kind of keep it up here, because I've only got one copy of them. Um, so then, you've, so you come up, get the rule, take it back to your team, um, shuffle the cards, so you kind of start off with a fresh pack of cards. Um, so, uh, actually, can we, 
Let me start, let me keep one of these packs of cards here. And maybe just give, give each table. So you're going to need four or five people. So, um, I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's good. I don't know. Woody, if you want to join in, you might want to go and. Okay, that's fine. Oh. If you've got any jokers, we don't need the jokers. So take the jokers out before you, before you shuffle them. So give the, give the deck a good shuffle to start off with, just so they're kind of reasonably mixed up. And then you just put the deck of cards face down um, in the table, on the table. So that's going to be the start. And you, you probably just turn over the first card. So, the, so we're going to start. With this pack of cards, we're going to start with the King of Diamonds. So that's, that's the start of your main line. And then um, as you go round, everybody then turns over a new card, has a look at the card, has a look at what's been laid out, has a think about what they think the rule is, decide whether they think this is going to conform to the rule or whether they think it's going to break the rule and position it. Um, and then the oracle will kind of go, yep, you got that right, or... No, you got it wrong. If you got it wrong, then move it to where it should be. So, so the, 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 the layout of the card should always give you a visual indication of, of, of what, uh, what the rule is. So that's the oracle. Any, any questions about the oracle role? Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry? Uh, so if the second card is wrong, then it would go... Under here, yeah. And if you if you put it here, and the oracle says no, that doesn't conform to the rule. Then you move it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Everybody else then are the players on the team. You're going to take it in turns, just to turn the top card over the deck, lay it on the table, decide whether you think it conforms to the rule or not, and place it, um, and, and kind of wait for the oracle to confirm or reject your, you know, your positioning. If they reject it, they'll move it to the right place. Um, so if it conforms, you put it to the right. If not, it goes below on the, uh, below the last correct card. So if there's already a sideline, you just add it to the sideline. If there's no sideline, you start a new sideline. Any question on this? Get a bit of instructions. We're going to do multiple rounds. So like the first round is usually a bit of a learning round. You learn, you, you learn from doing this the first time. When you make a correct assertion, so if you put it down and you put it in the right place and the oracle says, yep, that's right, as I said, you get to you make a guess. Um, and then if you guess right and you've guessed the rule, um, you're done. Um, we'll, we'll just do all one round together and then after that, we'll kind of leave you going. Once you're done with one round, just come up and find me. I'll give you the next rule. So come up with a camera, take a picture of the next rule, take it back. So swap the oracle each round so everybody, you know, we might not all get a chance to be the oracle, but hopefully most of you get a chance to be the oracle. And then the reason we just take it in turns on picking cards is just so everybody gets a chance to, to have a go at having a guess and get a feel for that. So we don't just want it to be a spectator sport where one person's doing all the guesses. Um, so I just put in this there, sometimes I go to places and... and do this, and people are not entirely sure about what I mean. So, you know, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, is that all familiar to people? So the rules are going to talk about the color of the card, red cards, black cards. They might talk about the suits, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. And then when we're talking about numerical rules, ace is 1, jack is 11, queen is 12, king is 13, and jqk. So everybody kind of, we don't, we, we don't have a problem with that. Sometimes it gets a little bit lost in translation. So I'm going to leave that there. How are we doing for time? Perfect. Um, let's, do, let's do one round. We'll kind of get a lot of you. The first, the first rule is, is hopefully fairly simple. If I don't um, curse myself there. So uh, work out who's, who's going to be your first oracle. That first oracle, just come up and get your first rule. Yeah, so one oracle per table. One person on each table will come up and be that first oracle. So I'm just going to put that down there. If you've got any questions about the rule, 
let me know, and I'll try and remember to turn the microphone off before I give the answers. Let me, let me, if I just put it down there. Okay, I'll leave this one up. So, every table has one oracle, and that oracle has the rule and understands the rule. So, um, we're going to spend maybe 20 or odd minutes on this. We'll kind of see how it goes. We'll see how kind of quickly you get through the rules. I want to give you a good chance to experience this. So, start. So, oracle. Place the cards down, turn over the face card, and then start going. And I'm just going to wander around, and I'll just kind of see how things are going and answer any questions. Sorry, let me just... Okay, I think everybody's got that nice, easy one to start off with. They're not all going to be that easy. They're going to get progressively harder. So we're just, we're just going to keep going now. So choose another person, choose another oracle. That oracle again, come up and get your next rule, bring a camera, take a picture of it, take it back and just start playing. And then as you guess the rules, just keep going because you're 
you're not all going to be doing it in sync. But I just wanted to make sure everybody's had one go. Same rule for every table. Uh, in the same order, yes. Ah. Yeah, yeah. And let me know if you have any questions about what the rule means. No, we don't need those yet. Next, that's the next exercise. So just carry on playing. I'll wander around if you've got any questions.
So we're going to give this about five more minutes, and then we'll, and then we'll do a debrief and move on to another exercise.
So I'll just give it another couple of minutes, just kind of uh, try and finish the one you're on. Yeah, if you could, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of these packs of cards have got missing cards. Okay, so just kind of finish the current conversation, oracles, uh, so if they've not guessed the current oracle round, just oracle let them know what it was, just so you know, people aren't staying awake at night trying to, trying to guess what it was. Sorry? <laughs> yes, yeah, we're finished with the cards now. Okay, so let's, let's do a kind of a bit of a debrief on that. Um, hopefully, hopefully it kind of sounds like people are having fun, lots of conversations, um, but, you know, what was the point? So, you know, what, why did we run that exercise? So I'm going to give you just five minutes. On your groups, just have a conversation on your tables. Thinking back to, to what you have just did, how did you go about discovering the rules? What, we kind of, what were the thinking process you were using? What techniques did you use? And was there anything that was really useful, you know, things that you did that found really helpful, or anything that happened that was helpful? And similarly, anything that you did or that didn't happen that, that didn't help you, that was unhelpful? So just kind of think about those three questions. How did you go about discovering the rules? What was useful or helpful? And what wasn't useful or wasn't helpful? Give you five minutes to have that conversation, and then we'll just kind of see, see what people talked about.
Okay. So, um, we've got some microphones. Just, there's one at the table. Let's kind of just, we might not go around every table, but does, does somebody on a table want to talk about the things you talked about, how you kind of, what, what answers you came up with? Anybody want to go first? Great, thank you. Down the front here. Okay, one was like uh, through the learning process. Um, I think with every action, there was a moment of learning whether we are on the right track or not. Mm -hmm. And again, like uh, it was a team accomplishing the goals rather than someone telling mm -hmm. this is how it needs to be done. Uh, Oracle playing an important role in guiding the team, but letting the team discover on its own. Um, learning, I would say, and reinforcement when uh, things were f falling in place and when we are in the right direction. I think that's the first one, and probably the second one was also that. You know, it was useful, Oracle coordinating and uh, the team working together and sharing the thoughts and discussions and uh, arrive at it. What was not useful, I think, in some cases we have seen um, uh, the same uh, uh, thoughts coming up, you know, uh, coming up with their incorrect conclusions yeah. at every step. But eventually figuring out, you know, that was not. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw that, that could have been a few tables. You just get a long sideline right, where you're just wrong. constantly getting cards yeah. that don't match. Right. And what's happening there is you're you're not getting any new information. Right. Uh, maybe occasionally, but um, it, it's only then when you suddenly get a, a card in the main line mm -hmm. that that's really powerful then, because like, why, why is this special? Why is this different to all of those? And that that generates that kind of lots process. of new information and lots of new thinking. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any, any, another table wants to kind of any anything different? Uh, yeah, not answering each question, but yeah. overall, uh, two things which emerged out of this table. One was the wrong answers, the wrong guesses were equally useful as the right guesses. Yeah, um, that was one. And the second one, oh, what um, we stopped in between, just guessing uh, the what could be the pattern. Mm -hmm. Spending a lot of time in thinking about what the pattern is, rather than playing quickly and trying to figure out the yeah. entire thing. So yes. maybe we should just play and yes, it's yeah, faster. Yeah. So I think there's the two 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 key points there. Um, one is yes, not not just the, the the having the wrong you know guessing wrong and those you know we can call those failures. Um, it's actually having it visible. So imagine if you played this, and when you had a wrong card, the oracle kind of went, oh that's wrong. I'm just gonna. I'm just going to hide that under the carpet out of the way because we don't like failure. So we're going to pretend it didn't happen. And you only had the main line. It can make it so much harder. It's being able to see not just the right, but also the wrong. Um, and then the other thing, yeah, kind of sometimes you just kind of get in really slowly. And sometimes those early rounds, those early guesses, you're just getting information and you're not really having a hypothesis. So I talked at the beginning, I kind of mentioned that distinction between an experiment and a probe. I would say those early rounds when you're just playing cards, you're probing. You don't really have a hypothesis that you're testing. You're just kind of a talk of probing because you probe the system and see how the system kind of responds. Does it bounce back? Does it, does it give you a slap? Um, you know, does it, does it laugh? Um, so yeah, you're just kind of getting, you know, you're just getting information. And then at some point, you start forming a hypothesis and now you can be a little bit more intentional. So that's, that's kind of one way of thinking about what's the difference between a probe and an experiment. Both are valid. But really, we will probably want to, in most cases, uh, want to be getting to a point where we're, where we're experimenting. But some of those, if you kind of go back to Kinevin, when you're in chaos, sometimes you, know, you don't, not only do you not have a hypothesis, you don't have time to make a hypothesis. So you're just doing stuff until, until things start stabilizing, and now you've got a bit more information and you can have a hypothesis. Yeah. Do, does one more table want to add anything? I think. Uh one thing that was not useful was overthinking. Uh, we were under the assumption that the rules get complex as we proceed. Yeah. And then even like the simple ones which were obvious, we couldn't guess it because we thought it is, no, it's more complex. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so yeah, those rules are designed to kind of ease you into it a little bit. Um, but sometimes even a simple rule, if you get the wrong run of cards, because of that point where you're not getting information, you know, even if it's red, black, red, black, and you play a red and then you're just getting constant blacks, um, it's not obvious until you suddenly get a red and then suddenly it's blindingly obvious, isn't it? Yeah, and that's that kind of, that information. So what that's happening, actually, so, so this is generally what goes on here, and this is kind of tying this back to the, um, the scientific method and tying a scientific approach. 
you usually start off with a, you know, a question, something you want to answer. In this case, is we want to learn what the rule is. In order to do that, we're kind of gathering information. So we're observing the pattern of cards. And you know, sometimes at the beginning, we don't have a pattern of cards. So we're just playing cards so we've got something to observe. Um, from that, we start forming a hypothesis that might be, hey, wait, I think the hypothesis is it's only number cards. Let's say that's what hypothesis. Then we test the hypothesis. So effectively, when we're playing a card and saying whether we think it conforms to the rule or doesn't, that's testing the hypothesis. So our hypothesis that, um, you know, if the rule is only numbers, our hypothesis is the numbers tend to follow the rule and face cards don't. Run the experiment and analyze the data. So maybe what we find out when we start looking at the data now is that, uh, yes, two and six follow the rule, but five doesn't. Okay, so we've just disproved our hypothesis. But equally, we've got a lot more information there. So we can now form a new hypothesis. So we interpret that data, form a new hypothesis. Um, and now we think, well, maybe it's just even rules. Uh, and we repeat that. And then we can share that learning with everybody else. So that's kind of that's the, the scientific process and trying to be intentional about what is our hypothesis? How are we going to test that hypothesis? Let's run an experiment. Let's look at the data, analyze the data. Let's see whether the data proves or, dis doesn't, or disproves our hypothesis. Um, and then we kind of compete until we've got enough confidence in our hypothesis. The, the key point is setting up an experiment such that you can disprove it. So many times we call them experiments, but really we're just, we're just kind of reinforcing confirmation bias, and there's actually no way of disproving it. And it's, it's really hard. Um, I kind of showed this slide yesterday, but hopefully you've kind of experienced this now. We've kind of talked about this a little bit. Information theory, so where the probability of failure is 0%. Um, so when you know the rule and you're just playing cards and you're getting it right all the time, you, you, you've not, you're not getting any more information because you, know, you know the rule. Equally, those times when the probability of failure is 100%, and this is those times when you're constantly getting cards which don't pass the rule, as you just experienced, you just, sometimes you're not really getting any information there. So the sweet spot is, is round about the middle where you're failing 50% of the time, so kind of when we want to generate new information. Um, I've never actually done this, but one of the times I want to try and do this is um, I'd like to somehow figure out a way of capturing some data around that where... I think the quicker you get it is where you've kind of got a closer mix or a closer number of mainline cards and sideline cards. And it becomes harder when you have more sideline cards. Or sometimes, you know, you might, um, doesn't, I don't think I saw it, and it's rarer, but sometimes if you get all the mainline cards and you don't get any failures, equally you could be getting no information and you still don't know the rule. So there's this idea of, you know, we have to fail generally when we want to generate new information. Um, I always caveat that because uh, an example I used yesterday, when I go to fly home, I don't want to be generating any new information about how the plane works and how the plane flies. I'm hoping everybody's figured that one out already, so I don't want my plane to fail. But when we're doing product development and organizational transformation, usually we don't know. There's lots of stuff we don't know, so we want to generate information. Um, the other idea to sort of throw in here is what we're doing there for is buying information. When you think of these experiments as buying information, so the smaller the experiment we can run, the cheaper it becomes and the safer it becomes to buy a new piece of information. So this is from uh, an example Don Reinertsen uses in Principles of Product Development Flow. Let's imagine uh, you're, you're just doing a lottery and the lottery is three digits. So there's, there's a thousand possible combinations of zero to 999, 000 to 999. You can pay $3 to select, and this is, this, is, you know, this is how lotteries work. You pay an amount, you guess all the numbers. You pay $3, you've got a one in 1,000 chance of getting it right. What we're trying to do by running experiments is saying, you know what, I'm only going to pay $1 just to guess the first number. So now I've reduced the odds to, from one in 1,000 to one in 10. And if I guess five, great, I could carry on. But if I guess six, I know I've not got the three-digit number. So I've just saved myself $2. Does that make sense? So by buying smaller pieces of information, instead of doing a one big change, you know, developing a, you know, a, a product, putting it to market, it's, it's effectively doing this. Your chances of failure and chances of losing money are much higher 
you can buy information, we can kind of pivot and kind of go, actually, let's pay another dollar to guess the first number again until we get it right. And you'll probably get to getting all three digits much quicker than just paying lots and lots of three digit guesses. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd say generally it's when, you, when you're trying to learn something that you don't know. So I don't think I'd apply to, do you say sport? No, I'm asking you know, if like this, this is the population of the community, the community, the community, the community. Yeah, when you want to generate information. So maybe not manufacturing, because manufacturing, you, hopefully you know, you've already learned, you've got the information, you know how to build it and you just want to use that information. So in manufacturing, you don't want any failures. But we're not doing manufacturing, we're doing software development, product development, and we're, we're trying to learn. Yeah? So that's that kind of caveat of when you want to learn new information. But if you know what you're doing, then you don't want failure. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, let's do another, another exercise. So let's build on that. Um, so this, this might be another, um, kind of Western cultural reference, I'm not sure. Um, do you have this game called Mastermind? Yeah, so you have this, there's a play this as a child, where you've kind of got colored dots, color, kind of colored markers, and you kind of create, again, you're creating your own secret code here, and then everybody else has to guess it, and you, the kind of the white and black pegs are giving you feedback on, on how accurate your guess is, okay? So we're gonna do a version of that now. So yeah, if we could put uh, maybe a, couple of copies on each table, that should, we should have enough. Um, we're going to do it slightly differently because we're going to do it with, with uh, numeric codes rather than colored codes, um, because that's easier. Um, so one of you, so we might only have chance to do to one round of this. Um, one of you wants to, is going to be the code maker. So you're going to um, take this piece of paper, So this is one of your sheets. Um, there's an area at the bottom for you to write the code. So whoever's going to be the code maker, hide the sheet from everybody else, and you're going to write a code at kind of a digit. So any, any of these boxes can be zero and nine. So you're basically going to make up a four digit number. And then you can just kind of fold it over there. So, you, so you're now hiding the code from everybody else on your table. Yep, so come up with a code. The code is four digits, um, so it could be one, two, three, four. It could be one, 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 one. So you, you might repeat a digit if you want to, if you're being particularly uh, evil. And then everybody else is going to try and guess the pattern. So you, you write your guesses along the top here, and then you're going to get feedback in this area here based on, um, so you're going to get two parts of feedback. So a, f a full dot, or kind of a, what I call, what I call a black dot, means that one of your numbers is a correct number and in the correct position. If you get a, an empty dot or a white dot, that means you've got a correct number, but in the wrong position. So you're going to guess. The code maker will, um, you know, they might just kind of want to have a quick double check, remind themselves what their code is. They'll fill in the feedback then you get to do another guess. So an example here. So let's say we've, we've, we've come up, and as a code maker, I've written the code 1234 in the bottom and turned it over and hidden it. Our first guess is 4537. I'm going to fill in a black dot because the 3 is the right number in the right place. And I'm going to fill in a white dot or an empty dot because I've got a four right number in the wrong place. Now this important thing, there's no correlation between the position of these dots and where, which number is there because that's going to make it far too easy for everybody. Okay? So basically what you do is to do the black dots first, kind of top left, Top right, bottom left, bottom right. So black dots, then white dots. So all this is telling you is the number of 
digits in the right place, number of correct digits in the correct place, and the number of correct digits in the wrong place. Does that make sense? Okay. Hopefully people are familiar enough with the, the, with the original game for that to make sense as well. So that's, that's basically, that's just mastermind. Yeah, question. Yes. Yes. So the, so the black dot, the three, is is correct, and it's in the correct position. But you but you're not going to tell them which one. No, 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 no. Yeah. So so that where that black dot is, isn't so it's not giving you any indication of which of those numbers. I, I've just drawn the arrow in there just to kind of for explanation. If there's if there's two if 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 we had uh, four, two, three, sorry, let me kind of, uh, one, one, two, six, seven. yeah, then the seven would be in the right place, but the, but you wouldn't, but the four is not. Correct. One, two, six, seven, you'd put two black dots and no white dots. Yeah. There's, there are four here because there are four here. So when you've got the code correctly, you would end up with four black dots. If I had, if I'd guessed the code as four, three, two, one, I'd have four white dots because I've got all the right numbers, but none of them are in the right place. Yeah? Okay. And is any other questions on the kind of the basic mastermind rules? Okay, so the next bit says so that's the that's the, the, the easy bit. <laughs> Why do we call it lean mastermind? We're gonna add a, a lean element, which is we're gonna kind of do a like the idea of a mini A3. So with an, when you're doing an A3 and an experiment A3, you're writing down in advance of the experiment what your hypothesis is, how you're gonna test it and then you write the results down as well. So the other bit of paper you have is this one. So the, the people that are doing, making the guesses, don't just write the numbers down. Before you write any numbers on this bit of paper, write down your hypothesis. So what do you hope to learn? What, what assumptions are you making? Why are you making that guess? That's your hypothesis. Then when the... Um, your, the code maker gives you some feedback. You know, do you consider that hypothesis? Do you consider that experiment a success or a failure? And then, what did you actually learn? So it's like really mini kind of A3 thinking here, where we're just using a row. So what we're trying to do here is it's really reinforce that discipline of thinking through your experiment. What is it you're trying to learn, and what do you actually learn? If you can write it down in a you know kind of relatively small piece of piece of paper, relatively small space on a piece of paper, then you probably you've kind of, you've, you've got a good coherent argument. So you just, so this is just starting to exercise and starting to think about how do we write down and how do we sort of articulate what our hypotheses and experiments are. Yeah. Any random number. Yeah. Any four digit random number. Anywhere between 0000, 0, 0, 0 and 9999. So, and, any questions on that bit? Any questions? So, one last instruction. We just have kind of just silence. I know everybody's desperate to get into it. Code makers, you can be kind of the judge and referee here as well. Don't give them any feedback until they can show you their written working of what their hypothesis is. Yeah? So, really make sure they do write something down. Okay, let's, let's just kind of give this 10 minutes. So we might only have time, if you, if you get it really quickly, um, then we might have some spare sheets and you can have another go, just let us know. But we might only have time to do one round. Any questions, otherwise I'll kind of just let you go. All good?
Yeah, they frequently. Now, the recently, in, next week, I think one is there in Hyderabad. But I'm not going there. So, if it is in Bangalore or online, I So, one tip with this is to try and make your learning as small and as specific as possible. Make your hypothesis as small and specific as possible. What about you? I uh, attend lot of this. Uh, because of your son, now you are doing it now. I mean, yeah, this was also not prior. Okay, we'll just give this another minute.
Okay, let's wrap that up. So can we, uh, let's all kind of come back together. If we can just wrap that up, be quiet. So if you, if, code, if you just need to kind of let people know what the code was again, just so, you know, you're not kind of sitting there worrying about it. Um, and then let's just spend a few minutes, again, just in your table groups, three questions again. Again, think about how did you go about discovering the code? What sort of techniques were you were using? Techniques or strategies? Were there any kind of particular strategies were you were using? Um, anything you did to, to try and maximize the learning you were getting? Um, and then how did you judge? When you were marking out your hypothesis and whether they were success or failures, how did you kind of think about, you know, how did you think about and judge success or failure? So uh, just, just a few minutes talking about those three questions, and then we'll, we'll just kind of get some, get some comments and answers back. Can we, can we do the same thing with the microphones for the key group as well? Okay. So let's, let's do the same thing as before. Um, just kind of wait for, the, wait for the handheld mics. So does somebody, does one of the tables maybe share the things you talked about, the answers you came up with? One advantage was that uh, the first code that we built. Shh, shh, shh. Sorry, can we just uh, have a little quiet while we do just kind of talk about yeah. the debrief? Thank you. The first attempt we built the code, uh, the, all the four digits were incorrect. Mm -hmm. So it made it easier for us to build the next code or the guess the next code because we we came up with a new set of numbers. Eliminated the ones, Eliminated the ones okay. which were not correct. So you were you were trying to eliminate numbers, yes. and then once you knew what the numbers were, thought you knew what the numbers were, then you could work out which yeah, position they yeah. were in. Yeah, we got okay. the numbers. We just had to guess the right sequence. Okay, so that was your kind of strategy. Did that, did that work? Did you did you guess the code? Yes, we did. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have any kind of different strategies or thoughts? Uh, uh, was the mic kind of dropping? So we experimented by uh, first trying odd numbers, mm -hmm. and then the even numbers. There's only 10 numbers to try. Yeah. Uh, and then we started removing each to figure out what the code is. We didn't get the code, but we learned that in the previous exercise, uh, the, the value of experimenting quicker, and here, using the hypothesis, it helps us think about applying some logic. Right. And in, in, the, in how we experiment, and the piece that we didn't manage to do is applying speed in applying the law in okay. the logic of experimenting as well. Okay. What? Right. Okay. Thank you. Did anybody kind of the, the last question in terms of success failure? What, any kind of thoughts on that one? So basically, out of six iterations, he was able to uh, get the answers right. So it's really intriguing uh, that you know how to correlate because you only have a choice of nine numbers. Mm -hmm. 
So I think in the first three steps only we will get to know what are the code. Yeah. So it's easy to crack the code with like maximum seven or eight or like six. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so, so the success or failure question in there is kind of because there's two ways of thinking about success or failure. One is does the, does the experiment succeed or fail? So does our hypothesis, um, you know, prove correct or do we disprove it? But the other way of thinking about success or failure is it's a successful experiment if it runs to completion and we get learning from it. And it's not a success if we run it and kind of go, none the wiser, don't have any more information. Um, so generally when we're talking about failure, we're talking about are we, you know, failure is disproving the hypothesis. But actually, you could argue that that's a success as well. Um, I wanted to, to give you a bit more of the backstory behind how we kind of decided to use this experiment. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the secret or how I, how I do this, what my strategy is. Um, so probably three or four years ago, um, it was Christmas, family Christmas get together. We'd all had a big Christmas dinner, a few drinks. It was the afternoon. Most of the kind of the adults, grown ups, were kind of starting to nod off and fall asleep. Um, my daughter, who would have been, you know, 15 ish at the time, was getting bored. So she went to the, uh, you know, my mum's my, my games box of all the old stuff and she found my own version of Mastermind, you know, the original version from when I was a child. Like, Daddy, can we play this? She's like, okay, I really didn't want to play it. Anyway, as I started playing it, I suddenly kind of made this connection between this is, this is scientific thinking. This is how you solve this. Um, so, <laughs> so I started to teach her scientific thinking through the game of Mastermind. Um, and in the process, took all the joy out of the game. <laughs> um, which wasn't really my intent, but, um, uh, but I, you know, I think she learned something in the process. Uh, and then the other thing that benefited me was once she took the joy of the game, she didn't want to play it anymore, and I could go back and have a little snooze. But what I did was, and the approach I ended up taking was, and this is my tip, was to create a smaller, you know, focus on learning as small a bit as possible. I would start this with the code 1111. The only bit of information I want to learn there is, is there a one in the code? If there is, I'm going to get a black dot. So basically, and, and if there's two of them, I'm going to get two black dots. So I know, however many black dots I get tells me how many ones there are. Now, I don't know where it is, but I can, I can figure that out in future experiments. So if there's, say, one, one in there, my next guess might be one, two, 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 two. Now I'm kind of figuring out where's the one and how many twos are there in there. So if I now get just a white dot, it means I know there's no twos in there and the one isn't in the first position. So really, really specific experiments to generate very specific learning. And actually, you can guess the code quite quickly, which is why it becomes a very boring game. Because I would always win, and my daughter kind of, because you know, she was just making random, not random guesses, but you know, the, the more numbers you put in there, if you do one, two, three, four, OK, you found out, is there one in there, is there two in there, is there three in there, is there four in there? But that's quite a lot of information. You still have to run more experiments to figure out, well, is it the one, is it the two, is it the three, and the four? So I, I started really small. So that's, that's that kind of tip with this one. And that's what you want to be trying to do with, with your experiments. The more specific you can make it, the more you're going to learn. And then, you, and then, kind of to the point about running them quickly, you actually can get, do that really, really quickly because you, you've kind of got this very clear strategy. So, so uh, sorry, I apologize if I've just taken all the joy out of this game for if you ever play with your children in the future. Was there... Was there a, yeah, it's one, one variable at a time. Yeah, yeah. The more numbers you're guessing, the more variables there are. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that leads us in the last bit, is, and I think you, you should have a copy of this. We're not going to have a chance to fill this in, but this is kind of the next stage that you could do. It's, it's the experiment A3. So what you're doing here, you've got a few more fields in there, but this is the idea of intentionally writing down um, your, your hypothesis, your experiment, um, you know, your context is, is kind of, well, what's the current situation in the game? What information do you currently have? Or what's the current problem you're trying to solve? What, what, why is it you're running the experiment? What's your hypothesis? So what do you think, how, how, what do you think might solve this? Um, and then what's your rationale? So if you can kind of go, what problem are we trying to solve? How do we think we're going to solve this? And why do we think this is the right solution? Being able to articulate those three on a, in an A3 piece of paper, 
um, means that you can now communicate that with other people. You can get feedback on it because you can show that to somebody and can they make something, can you, your rationale's wrong or I, I don't believe this hypothesis. In which case, where, where you, people don't believe the hypothesis, what do you do? Just run the experiment. <laughs> You'll soon find out it's not about whether the hypothesis is correct or not, it's about the learning you get from it. Then you start coming up with some, some actions and the key point is there the actions that might prove it but also what actions might disprove it. So explicitly thinking about proving and disproving, which means we can, you know, getting that idea of success failure. What are you going to look for that's going to tell you whether your hypothesis is correct, but also what are you going to tell you, what are you going to look for that, that is going to tell you that hypothesis is not correct and it's a failure. So being explicit about thinking about these things up front before you run the experiment. And then similarly, because we want these experiments to run really quickly, it's not the end of it. So if our hypothesis is correct, there's probably going to be further work that we can do. So what are our next steps going to be? So, you know, if our hypothesis is, is, is my one, 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 if there's a one in there, my hypothesis is correct, my next steps are going to be figuring out where the one is and then figuring out what the next number is. So what are you going to do next? Or if it's a failure, what are you going to do? So if there's no one in there, well, I'm just going to move on and, and start looking at twos and threes, etc. So thinking about this, articulating it, writing it down in advance is just good discipline to help you kind of think this through. And then you can do this as a collaborative exercise. It's, it's a learning exercise. It's a, it's a knowledge sharing exercise. Um, you can do this as a, as a kind of a mentoring exercise. So A3s in Toyota were used as kind of a, a learning and a mentoring exercise. So a manager would, would get one of their um, employees to fill in the A3 and come back and they would mentor them through it. So they're not giving them the answer. They're mentoring people on figuring out the answer. So you get a lot of learning. And then, once you've run the experiment, you've now got documentation about what you did, why you did it, and what the results were. So this then becomes information that you can share. So it's making it all explicit, making it all visible. Okay, just to wrap up, um, finish off my, my Wordle. Um, so this is an example again. I, my, my daughter does Wordle. And this is one where I kind of got really, really stuck. And I was saying to my daughter, um, I basically said to her, if you get this and I can't, I'm going to be really, really cross with you. And of course, she got it, but I did get it in the end. But at this point here, I was stuck. I, couldn't, I didn't know. I couldn't think of any words that had an O in the middle and an I either there or there, which is my logical next step. So what I actually guessed was piano. I know piano is wrong because I've put an A here, and I know there's an O there. But I made a deliberately wrong guess to get information. Because what I was trying to find out is, well, is there a P in there? Is the I there, specifically? Uh, and then I'm kind of figuring it in the end there. So, okay, it's wrong, but I now know where the I is. So I've got some really valuable information there. Again, okay, so now what's a word that's something I owe something something? Couldn't think of anything. Again, racking my brain, getting really frustrated. So again, I made a deliberately wrong breast, and ironically, we're in India, it's Balti. Um, well, I'm, I've not even used the O. And I've, I've put the I in the wrong place. I'm basically, I'm just trying to find out, and, I, and I've used the A again. I'm kind of just going, I'm just thinking of words that fit, that use letters that I've not used. So is there a B, is there an L, is there a T? So at least the information I've got there is, is more letters. So I'm now down to you know, word you kind of have the keyboard below here, and it kind of grays out the letters you've used. I've, I've kind of got enough information now that I know it's something I owe something something, and the number of possible letters that it could be is small enough that it gives me kind of en enough information to guess. And I don't know, is anybody, any, anybody going to want a quick guess and really know what the word is? No. It's kiosk, which is, it's got two blinking Ks in there. I mean, how would I supposed to know that? But anyway, I got it eventually, but only because I made these two deliberately long guesses to, to one, figure out where the I was and rule out enough letters that, 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 that there was basically, at that point, only one possible word it could be. Now, luckily, Wordle lets you, in between here, it doesn't show, Wordle lets you guess words that are not words, and they don't count against you. So, in between, certainly here and now, I was just randomly typing words in, just in case they existed or that I didn't know about them. And eventually, you know, the, the brain makes a connection. You kind of go, ah, oh, oh, yeah, kiosk. So, yeah. Sometimes you, you do things which you know are going to be wrong 
because you get information. So that's actually deliberately failing to get information. OK. Um, I, I'm not sure we've got time for questions, but hey, I'm going to stick around. If you, if you want to ask me questions, come up and, and say hello. I'll upload the slides to, to the website. And um, you'll have noticed on here that both of those games, and if you go to my, my blog, availability.co.uk, both of those games, you can download the slides. The, the card game, the Eleusis Expeditious, has a slide which has all the rules in there as well. So you can go off, and they're all open source. You can go off and, and do these things yourself, and the, the, the templates are there for download. So thank you very much. Hope that was fun. Hope that was useful.